Against the LAMTA uh, over a fair increase in the allocation of service across neighborhoods. So uh, um, after UCLA, uh, Kurt cut his teeth as a public transit planner and analyst with a private consulting firm, well known for their work in this area and uh, with the transit operator in the San Diego area. Um, <clears throat> at Houston, uh, Kurt oversees short and long range service planning, service and environmental planning, ridership analysis, and uh, the ridership analysis and reporting, emergency evacuation planning and coordination, and fixed route scheduling, including the recent and dramatic reimagining of service uh, there. So please join me in welcoming Kurt back to UCLA to hear about reimagining transit networks, the story of Houston, Texas. Thank you for, thank you, Brian. It's good to, uh, good to be back. So I'm just curious, uh, how many folks in here are uh, hoping to go into a career in uh, transit planning? Oh, that's much better before. I, I joked with Brian the last time I came out. Uh, he said he gave pause to a lot of his students who were uh, overwhelmingly interested in bicycle and pedestrian planning. And I told him my, my goal was to save you all from a, a life of uh, being pedestrian and bicycle planners. No, we actually, we actually do quite a bit of that now. Um, so anyway, it is great to be back. I'm sorry for, uh, I'm still trying to cool down. I've actually been traveling quite a bit uh, these last few weeks. So I'm going to, uh, please forgive me if there's uh, any spelling errors in this that I will be embarrassed about, but uh, I finished writing this very early in the morning, uh, Tuesday morning in Tampa, where I was giving a, a different speech after several previous days in, in Grand Rapids. There's been a lot of interest in this throughout the industry. For those of you who might know, the uh, transit industry has been going through a bit of a reckoning on what its ultimate purpose and goal should be. Ridership has been falling um, for the last couple years, and our friends at APTA like to, to hide the fact uh, that so goes nationwide ridership statistics is basically dependent upon New York City. Uh, and just like Houston having uh, Harvey hit us this past year, uh, New York had Sandy visited a couple years ago. So year over year comparisons last year were just wonderful for the industry and particularly for New York, but it wasn't particularly uh, useful in telling anything other than New York was back at full strength running service again after the hurricane. So with that, we'll jump in. Uh, for those of you who might not know a lot about Houston, um, good and the bad, we do everything. The joke is, you know, everything is bigger in Texas, bigger refineries, bigger hurricanes, bigger lazy rivers on top of uh, downtown uh, hotels, which I find very audacious and very, very Texan. Um, <laughs> And uh, go Astros, so sorry, uh, even though I'm an Angels fan. Uh, and for those of you, Marty's not in here, so I can badmouth the Dodgers, I guess, uh, while, while I'm at it. But um, we do everything bigger, including our, including our traffic. I always thought, I actually grew up in Southern California. I grew up in Orange County. And I always thought I had never was going to see more concrete than I did at the, uh, at the, uh, at the 5405 Crush down in South Orange County uh, until I got to Texas and saw the Katy Freeway and it's 26 lanes wide. Freeway, HOV, HOT, and frontage roads, um, which they spent like $2 billion five years ago uh, widening. And of course, what do you think that did in more than a year? Solved it. <laughs> Solved it, yes. <laughs> Exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's worse now than, uh, than it ever was. So, uh, Houston in a nutshell, for, for us, uh, Houston Metro is the tri primary transit provider uh, for the city of Houston and for most of Harris County that it resides in. We, op we, op we operate approximately 1,200 vehicles, uh, 76 light rail vehicles, uh, paratransit and van pool. As far as bus service, we run local rapid and commuter services. 23 miles of light rail, very expensive HOV, HOT lane network. 
And our fixed route boardings are approximately 80 million a year to sort of put us in perspective. So why did we actually go through this process of reimagining our system? Uh, first of all, this was a, a graphic on what we heard from our customers when we went to update our long-range plan last time in 2011. And for those of you who have ever worked for a transit agency or an MPO, you have to do a long-range plan every so many years, and you schedule lots of meetings with the public, and you go out and ask them, what would you like to see from this agency in the future? And you usually get a long wish list of capital-intensive projects. I want to see commuter rail here. I want to see a light rail extension to the airport. Uh, people movers, transit centers, park and rides. Again, very capital intensive things. Half of our comments were about the, the bus system when we went out and, and spoke. And that really took our, our board and our staff by surprise. More people came and said, you know, the bus just doesn't really run frequent enough for me. I don't work a typical 9 to 5 job. It's not there when I need it, when I get off work at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night or I work on the weekends, or gosh, I'd really like to not have to depend on my friends, family, uh, others in my congregation to get me to church on Sunday or to go shopping. Um, so it was really a wake-up call for sort of staff and the board to hear uh, this, which had been very different from past endeavors. We were also going through the process, um, I think of most large size uh, metropolitan areas, we were obsessed with rail for a good 15 years, um, thought that was going to solve everything, and we were in the process of, we had gotten our full funding grant agreement, we were in the process of building two new rail lines and, and a light rail uh, extension. So staff was already thinking about how we were going to have to make changes to the bus system anyway to make sure that everything was integrated and worked as one complete system. So it wasn't like change wasn't going to be happening for us anyway. Uh, we also were, uh, very aware of how we were performing versus our peers. Uh, this is um, this is very uh, it's quite a wake-up call when you look at your peers and see how you fare. And you know the main point of most transit agencies you're measured by what your ridership was. Well, I can say we didn't quite win that battle. St. Louis managed to lose more. Unfortunately, they went through a financial disaster and had to cut like 40% of their budget. Um, so, yay, St. Louis, for those of you who are there. But in terms of productivity, we were, um, we were plummeting. And uh, we won, or at least if you had turned the chart upside down. Uh, we're number one there. So we knew we had quite a bit of work uh, to do. But what really got the board's attention was when we looked at the long-term trend. And this is what our ridership looked like system-wide over sort of a 12-year period. The local bus area is sort of in the red. And you can see we went from, uh, we almost were carrying about 100 million passengers per year and we were down to about 80. And almost all of that was a loss in local bus. And it wasn't because we were cutting service. That blue line in there is actually the amount of revenue hours that we were providing over time which is why we were getting less and less productivity out of our system. We were providing more service, but yet our ridership was going in the wrong direction. I don't think I need to explain that that's a recipe for disaster. Um, some of those riders had shifted because we had opened light rail in 2004, uh, but the majority of it is we were losing local bus passengers. So this really got the board talking about a very simple but troubling question why aren't people riding the bus anymore? <coughs> and there were, this was back in 2012. And it was sort of a, our come to Jesus moment. Are we really willing to talk about why this is? Um, I think most of us in the planning world have a pretty good idea of sort of the big picture reasons that ridership is going down and we'll, we'll talk about some of them. But a lot of them make your elected officials and your boards very uncomfortable to talk about that there's some sort of problem and you haven't been addressing it in our case for a decade or more. And I think this is very timely because the industry is going through this process right now. So we started to have quite a conversation about why fewer people are riding the bus. So this is a, a graphic representation of our park and ride network. 
we have just because we have so much HOV, HOT lanes um, with pretty high reliability and travel speeds, we have a very extensive park and ride network. It would actually be, I think, the fourth largest commuter rail network in terms of boarding in the country if it was actually uh, steel wheels. And ridership on the park and ride was actually growing, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the problem during this 12-year period at all. And there have been lots of studies. Our, our downtown management district had a look at sort of uh, how ridership was or what sort of market capture they had for the people working downtown based on how far they live from downtown. So for the people who lived very close to downtown, 0 to 1, 1 to 5, 5 to 10, very low percentage did we capture, which was really sort of, those are the people who would be taking local bus. They wouldn't be taking an express bus. But once you get out of sort of the, the, the inner suburbs and you know, 15, 20 miles and more out, we become very competitive because of the HOV lanes and sort of the guaranteed uh, travel time savings that we had and that protection. So again, it wasn't the park and ride service. But we started to talk about what we've known in a long time. People like frequency. Frequency of bus service solves a lot of the problems that make people uncomfortable about riding the bus. And we had lots and lots of service that was very infrequent. So this was our old route structure. So very quickly, the, the red lines represented service that ran every 15 minutes or better most of the day. Blue roughly every 30, and the green uh, hourly, sort of coverage type service. So that was a typical weekday uh, for us. And lots of stuff that, again, wasn't very frequent. Our service was very confusing. This was one of my <laughs> favorite, or I should say least favorite routes. Um, this was the 40 PCOR telephone. We basically had interlined a bunch of routes uh, through downtown over time and, and hooked them all together. And that's what it was referred to, the 40 PCOR 40 telephone. It had like 12 different branches. Some went on the freeway, some didn't. Uh, some made deviations that were only one trip throughout the whole day in a particular direction. Uh, we had patterns uh, that would only operate for a few hours a day in one direction. And it was very hard to, to understand for our operators. And for me, one of my first lessons, I had only been at Houston a couple of months. And I was having a staff meeting. And I had a very, our vice president at the time was a very uh, typical Bostonian. Uh, very loud, very Irish, uh, very in your face. And he burst into our staff meeting declaring that he had to get to a bus stop and he wanted to know how to get there immediately. And everyone went, okay, John, I need some more information. Where is this bus stop? So he <laughs> tells us what the, what the street is. And, and so my staff goes and, you know, is trying to figure out where it is. And um, so in the meantime, while we're trying to figure out where, where exactly this, this bus stop is, he's like, yeah, it's important that I get out there immediately. There's a dead body in the shelter. I'm like, what's the hurry? <laughs> Is it going to be less dead by the time you get there? Um, and I'm not quite sure what the head of planning and engineering is going to do about a, a, a dead body that's uh, in this bus shelter. But our staff came back, and I still remember just the look of utter fear in my, my junior planner's face as he's, he's whispering in my ear, Kurt, this is a deviation on the 40. It, it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, we only run three trips there in the morning. The last trip was at 8.15, and, and my VP is, wants to ride the bus there. He's like, the next bus leaves in like 21 and a half hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> so needless to say, I said, go check out a car and <laughs> drive it out there. Um, it was way down, way down here on, on one of those fun deviations. So it, it was hard for staff to figure out what the, what the route was doing, harder for, uh, for management, and certainly hard for our, our customers. And we had many of these things. We had nearly 100 bus routes, uh, about 120 different deviations uh, on all of those, not including short lines, and uh, very hard to understand the service. A lot of our service was very indirect. So when you look at this, this is actually um, two points that are on the same street there, Houston tomorrow, 
It's actually a, a research institution that looks at transportation and quality of life issues in Houston. And if you wanted to go from Houston tomorrow, which was on Richmond, over to uh, Texas Southern University, which is a fairly good sized university, again on the same street, despite the fact that the street name changes three times, that's one of the things that I love about Houston. Um, if one name's good, four names for a street is better. Um, but to basically go this four or so miles, uh, again, you can see that transit trip of 53 minutes and three buses and not really the most direct path. You get to see a lot of Houston. Um, as opposed to if you just jumped in the car, you could probably do this in 18 or, or 20 minutes. So um, getting this trip plan when you do Google or anything doesn't really get people too excited uh, about making trips. And that was far too much of our service. Then there was the weekends. You've already seen this map. This is our weekday service. Um, 14 frequent routes uh, that we had on weekdays. When you started to look at Saturday, a couple things. Uh, the number of frequent routes goes from 14 to 3. Um, a lot of the red go to blue, a lot of the blue go to green, and a lot of the green just flat out, as you can see, really disappear particularly outside of uh, the downtown area. And when you go to Sunday, more of the same. We're down to one route, which happened to be a trunk of a, of a, of a route with two patterns uh, on Westheimer. It is our best corridor, but that was the only lonely frequent route on Sundays. So it made it very hard to get around if you did not have a typical Monday through Friday uh, type job, or for any other type of non-work trip. The bus really didn't go where a lot of people needed to go. This is looking at our population density and Houston has uh, predominantly, when Houston was first sort of formed around downtown and that's where all the, the red routes there come together. A lot of the original Houston and working class areas was to the north and to the east uh, of downtown. But we've seen significant population loss. They were heavy, heavily African-American neighborhoods, prominently low income. And over time, the powers that be at the city really did not invest any money, capital projects there. And there's very little hope of attracting new folks there. So what happened to these neighborhoods that were largely very transit um, oriented and in their use, very heavily used, their kids grew up, and as soon as their kids graduated from high school, they got out because there were no jobs. The folks who were riding the bus to work, they got older, they retired. They went from using the bus five, six, seven days a week to using it once or twice a month. So the need for transit hadn't really changed, but the amount that they needed it had changed. But yet we were still running quite a bit of frequent service out there, and we were ignoring sort of the south and to the west where we were densifying. Um, this is one of the areas, it's called our Gulfton neighborhood, um, where you see a, a bunch of red there if you go, uh, right under the 25 route there, you go a little bit further west and you see a lot of uh, red and dark orange there. It's the Gulfton neighborhood, it's one of the densest neighborhoods outside of New York City. People don't really associate density with Houston. Um, I won't talk about as a planner what most planners associate Houston with. Um, but eight out of 10 new immigrants to, to the city actually start their lives in Houston in this area. It's almost all two and three story apartments um, for two or three square miles. And it, it, it's a wonderful mix of ethnicities and cultures. And folks are coming from countries that have a very um, good history of riding transit, but yet we provided them very poor levels of service um, for them. So, we really didn't help uh, the vast majority of people who needed our service. This is another way of looking at sort of the job density. Each dot, I forget, is how many jobs in Houston, but these are sort of the major activity centers, just like Orange and LA County that have sprung up. You know, originally it was downtown LA, and now you have Century City and Santa Monica and Culver City and Burbank and all these other job centers. Houston's no different. We now have seven relatively huge, they'd be huge downtowns on their own rights. Um, but in downtown, you see we, roughly we carry one in three employees to downtown. And in the, in the medical center, um, it's about one in four that we carry. But in all the other major ones that are further and further away from downtown, 
the, the mode share is very low. And you know, again, the question is why? And I'll also say a lot of agencies, this was very typical, our, uh, our public information was not very helpful. I, um, I love the simplicity of our old bus stop signs. So if you can imagine this bus stop um, on a street, there's one right across the street from it going in the other direction. So it's nice enough we tell you it's the 75 route and it's called the Eldridge Crosstown. I'm going to try to ignore the size of the letter and the fact that it's not ADA compliant in terms of height, but this sign doesn't exist anymore. So. Um, but if you can imagine, and so if you have a problem, there's Metro Police and call customer service to complain, why isn't the bus showing up? But if you can imagine the bus going in the other direction on the other side of the street looks just like this. So if you're new to the system and you're trying to figure out, gosh, where's my bus? Where am I going? Where am I supposed to stand? This um, doesn't really help you in any significant way other than if you have a cell phone, you can call customer service and ask them to explain it to you. Um, but our signage was not very helpful. And then there was our system map. Oh, the rainbow of colors. Um, it was very colorful. Um, and you could follow just about any route on the map. But once again, there's only one thing that this map told you. It was that at some point during the week, <laughs> we ran this bus at indeterminate frequency of a span, who knows, um, and it might or might not stop where you actually are. <laughs> um, so with those caveats, it was a beautiful system app. Um, but yet it, it communicated virtually nothing to customers or, or, or potential customers. And you're going to see this theme when we talk about so, so many decisions that we've made over time. They're not about the customer. And that's what is strikingly different, different when you work in the private sector versus the public sector. The private sector, everything, you have to make money. You have to know what your customers think. For right or wrong, Google, Facebook, they know what you're thinking. Um, they know what you like, what you, uh, what you dislike. Um, we make decisions in the public sector a little bit different based on how much money we have to spend and are we going to get too much opposition from the public, from our board, from elected officials, from whomever. Um, so you get a very different outcome because of that. So uh, let me just say I do love our marketing group. They are, they are a very creative bunch, but they were... Uh, they were settled for a long time and not being able to do very creative stuff. So, um, I actually stole this from our board member who actually goes around talking about this because most staff members would, would not dare to say this because you might not have a job the next day. But having this discussion at the board while your board meeting is streamed live and then archived for all to go back and watch and actually talking openly, why is our bus system so bad? Um, after they asked us, you know, why aren't more people riding the bus, was very enlightening and terrifying uh, at the same time. And for the most part, our board is pretty typical. They're, they're appointed members. They've generally not stepped on a bus in years. Um, they might have ridden the rail line, um, which again, our rail line experience, our rail line runs every six minutes up and down the street. It's everything that you'd hope for in a transit system. It's frequent. It has a great span of service. You're not worried. You walk out. It's a pretty much a straight line through downtown. So you walk out. You can see the next train coming. Or you know if you just saw the, the train depart, eh, the next one's coming in six minutes. It's that frequency and that simplicity that, that melts away a lot of the angst of people's using it. And that's our, our board and a lot of our senior member management's experience. It's riding that train at lunch. Not what a local bus user experiences. So we had this discussion openly and as honestly, I think, as staff was willing to admit uh, publicly. But I'll say there, there's one example that, that particularly sums it up. And it's our old 11 Nance bus route. Uh, here you see it traipsing through downtown near our, near our convention center. And like most historical bus routes, it was a descendant of a streetcar once upon a time. 
when uh, a private developer developed the neighborhood, built Nance, uh, built the neighborhood not far from downtown, ran the trolley the length of, length of Nance Street, then took it downtown, circulated through and, and returned, and made their money again building houses there, as most streetcar suburbs did. But over time, what happens to the simple streetcar? Of course, we all know the history of streetcars, you know, went away, buses took over. And then the route gets extended a little bit as more neighborhoods develop. Um, then it gets extended a little bit more, and then a public facility is built. It's a little off the beaten path, so we deviate to go to that. And then TxDOT, our own version of Caltrans, um, and I do love highway engineers, um, ramrodded several freeways right through this neighborhood, actually cut Nant Street in half. It doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, so what's left is the 11 Nant bus is actually on Nance for all of about three blocks. So even if you're standing at a bus stop, remember those bus stop signs, and it says 11 Nance and you're in downtown, you have no idea where Nance Street is, unless you're one of the seven remaining people who live on Nance Street. Um, and that's what's happened to most people's, or most agencies' systems over time. They have not changed them, uh, or they've not comprehensively looked at them in many years. You make each one of these incremental changes over time, and each one makes sense at the time. There's this new facility. They've, you know, they've opened this new street. Uh, we have to serve this. Budget cut this, or we get more money. Um, but then you step back, and 20, 30 years later, and you go, what is this? Um, and we had way too many routes. Uh, that had the same kind of story. So, we embarked on a little different philosophy. What most agencies do every five, ten years, is they go through a, a it's called COA, Comprehensive Operational Analysis. It's great work as a consultant, I've done them. And you go and you run statistics about every bus route in a particular system. And you look at which ones are performing well and which ones are performing lousy on a number of metrics. And then you look at the characteristics of the routes that are performing well and you suggest ways for them to have a few more routes perform like those. And the ones that aren't performing so well, you suggest they do a little bit less of that kind of service. And then you charge a couple hundred thousand dollars and you move on their way and the agency may or may not do anything with that. But that's fairly typical, and that's not what our board wanted to do. The board said, hey, we have a very talented staff. Let's supplement them with a consultant. All of you know everything that we need to know about Houston. We know where people are living, we know where they're working, we know where they're going to school. We have all this rich data. We're very lucky. We have automatic passenger counters on every bus or train, so I do not have a lack of ridership information. The MPO has lots of information on population projections. Um, what if we started with a clean sheet and that we were running no buses today and you were designing a system from scratch? And that sounds great. I don't have to worry about any of these past stupid... 11 minutes, things before. But the problem is you've had staff who have been there 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And they might not have been responsible for each one of those little deviations. But they remember Aunt Edna with her cane waddled up to the board microphone and complained that she couldn't go to see her sister or she couldn't get to the doctor or whatever. And the board admonishing staff for not allowing Aunt Edna to do whatever it is she couldn't do on the system and directing staff to fix it. And there's dozens, if not hundreds, of these over time, particularly if you've had staff who've been there a long time. And they have those battle scars from that. So while it sounds easy, it's still hard to divorce yourself from those past battles. And every compromise that you made. Because again, it's very simple. I don't want to I don't want to wish myself out of a job. But it's very easy to increase ridership. We all know what drives ridership. Bus service, train service, public transit service in general works when you connect where a lot of people live 
with where they want to go to work, school, the doctor. It's relatively simple. The more service you can do that, the better you are. Um, the airlines do it. The airlines don't, you know, if the airlines can't fill planes between LA and Boise um, or Topeka, I was at a conference and somebody actually used Boise as an example and that was, did not go over well with the particular crowd uh, <laughs> that day. Um, but you're gonna run more, you're gonna run more, you're gonna fly more planes from LA to San Francisco or LA to Las Vegas than you are to Boise. It's very simple to understand. And they can do it because they're a private company. They can't fill those planes, they move those planes elsewhere. Doing the same in transit is very different because we have competing objectives. Not only are we supposed to carry lots of people, and I'll get into all the different things transit has to do, but we're also, we're also asked to be that social service, to be that last resort for people who can't or don't want to drive. And balancing those two things can be quite difficult. So we embarked on this reimagining, and I have to admit at the time, I hated the term reimagining. I actually unsuccessfully lobbied our board and our board member who came up with this term, uh, and our CEO, please don't call it this. Um, I lost. And it's funny now, I see on TV now, you see CEOs talking about, we are going to reimagine our brand. We are going to reimagine. I never heard this term uh, before five years ago. And now it is everywhere. It is, um, it, it's been fascinating to watch. So as I talked about transit service, we spent a long time talking about goals and objectives for our service before we actually got down to the nitty gritty of how do we plan uh, what plan the new network. So transit service, as we know, has many different goals and often they're competing. So first and foremost, maximize ridership. If you're a transit agency and the public gives you X amount of money, you better carry people. If you don't carry many people, folks are gonna ask, why are we taxing ourselves? Why are you relevant? Um, so you can't forget about uh, what are your ridership numbers and are they going up or are they going down? Is our job to provide a little bit of service to every part of the service area? They pay taxes too. Why shouldn't we provide a bus to that long, lonely cul-de-sac? Um, because they pay taxes too. Is that equitable? Um, and we have to, we have to argue, uh, argue about that repeatedly. Is our job to serve particular populations of concern? The elderly, the young those with mobility impairments. They have special considerations for us. How much service, how much money do you spend um, transporting those who have no other choice? Transit, particularly if you are a transit consultant or you do EISs or you want a full funding grant agreement for a, for a rail line or a trolley or a rail extension, Transit is all about economic development, or at least that's what the studies say. We're gonna cause this many more square feet of office to be built. We're gonna cause this mall to redevelop um, and create all these jobs. And in some cases, that is, that is true. Um, but how much emphasis should we give on that uh, for different types of projects? So is traffic, transit supposed to help relieve traffic congestion? All I can tell you is there should have been a whole lot more transit on the 405 this morning coming up from Orange County. Um, so I almost missed the start of this class. Um, but we're often uh, used, that we do this particular transit improvement, we're gonna take lots of cars off the road. What I think actually happens is we just, we enable more trips and more people to, to come to a particular area. Um, and that's good, but I'm not sure that it's ever really going to relieve traffic congestion. And there's air quality, we put lots of people on buses, take them all out of, you know, in, you know, single, single uh, driver cars, you're gonna improve air quality. Just have to have enough people on the bus to actually make that so. If you run empty buses around um, and they're diesel, I'm not sure that you actually help air quality uh, at all. I think a lot, of, I think there's a lot of hope for this, particularly as we move to, to electric cars in the, in the future. But as I, uh, as I like to, re to remind some of our board members, it really depends on where you get that electricity from. 
you're just moving that pollution to somewhere else. Um, you know, if that's wind energy, wind's very popular in Texas, uh, large parts of our state. Uh, makes me think I'm going gambling at the Indian casinos out by uh, Palm Springs. Um, so, you know, when buses are all run off of, you know, again, wind, solar energy, that's great. Um, but if it's hydroelectric, if it's nuclear, you know, there's, there's externalities there that aren't factored in. You're just moving the source of that pollution. So the last trade-off uh, that I always like to tell is, and I've made many decisions this way, what is going to be easiest for our board to accept? And let them not get yelled at. It's not very sexy. I, I don't really like to, to admit that, but um, making our board uncomfortable makes staff uncomfortable and our CEO uncomfortable. And we've done plenty of things on how can we just move on from a particular uh, issue. So for us, um, we hired a consultant. And one of the two things that we did I think was a little bit different uh, in this reimagining was we really focused on engaging the public meaningfully early in the process. I'll tell you what often happens with these projects. So board will tell you we're not happy with ridership, do a COA. So you hire a consultant, they do a COA, come up with this plan, present to the board, board says great, go out to the public. And you go out to the public, and the public hasn't seen any of this. And the public goes, what is this? Who told you this was a good idea? What were you thinking? Um, and you get screamed at. And depending upon how much screaming, the COA might quickly end, or you might make significant changes to it, and you might be able to salvage the project. What our board actually asked us to do was form a very large stakeholder group and most agencies regularly do these things. They usually have a couple dozen people. We had 120. It's like herding cats. Uh, from all different agencies, um, public, private, customers, drivers, um, nonprofits, elected officials, all sorts. And at each stage, when we were going through the goals and objectives, uh, when we eventually came up with a plan, we actually presented those results or had those discussions with our stakeholders group first before we went to the board. And I can say for our board, that was very risky um, because the, one of the worst things that can happen for you as a staff member is to have a member of the media corner your board member and ask you, what do you think about X? And that board member had no idea what X is. Um, don't know if it's good, don't know if it's bad, don't know how much it costs. Um, so when we actually sat down with, with our stakeholders and talked about goals, our board wanted to know what the stakeholders thought before they weighed in. Uh, before we presented our board the draft service plan, they wanted to know what the stakeholders thought, good and bad about it. And that's very different than most um, the processes most agencies go through, because again, it was risky. Um, to do that. Now, as staff, we tried to, okay, we're briefing the stakeholders one day, we're going to brief the board the next day. Just so that gap in between, so the opportunity for our board members to look silly uh, if they were cornered was minimized. Um, but here was a, an all-day uh, working session we had with our, we actually got about 80 of our 120 stakeholders to devote the whole day. Um, fed them, did several activities, did lots of uh, voting that we'll go over. Um, they were very engaged. It was also very um, data-driven, which I guess is differently. In a different place in this presentation, again, I, I apologize. I've made this presentation three different versions in the last week, um, so I'm not quite sure where I'm going to talk about this. But the trade-offs we talked about, we have... Um, now they don't even use handhelds to do real-time polling anymore. Now you can do it on your cell phone uh, and such. But we did real-time polling, and we talked about all these trade-offs that we talked about. So we talked about how important is ridership, um, uh, carrying lots of people, versus providing a little bit of service in every part of our area. And we let people vote on each one of these, sort of on a scale of one to five. 
and it would pop up on the screen, and then we'd talk about it. And then we'd ask people who'd vote at different ends of that spectrum, why do you feel that way? And we had some really good discussions about what different people thought in the room. And then we allowed them to vote again to see if they, they changed their mind. And in some cases, some of the discussion did actually change people's mind um, slightly. So connections versus complexity. Um, you can have, we had a very complex uh, system. You probably could get a direct bus wherever it was you're going. It might just be only one trip that goes there, or it might only be in the AM peak, um, versus having a more uh, grid-like structure where you might have to connect to get there. Um, but you have more opportunities to do that. Route spacing versus frequency. Again, you provide fewer routes. You can have more of them be frequent. Um, versus if you have more routes, you have to spread that same money out and you have less frequent service. And it's also a case of are you willing to walk further for frequent service? We had a, quite a discussion about peak period versus all day service. How important was it during midday and particularly evenings vis-a-vis uh, -vis that uh, the peak commute time for folks? Weekday versus having seven day a week service on routes. And also about who were we trying to serve? Was it more important to attract those new customers? Um, you know, the, the elusive choice rider, and I, I hate the terminology, you know, choice riders and, and transit dependents. I don't think anybody's really a choice rider, and I don't think anybody's really transit dependent. The transit dependent side, I can tell you plenty of times Agencies have made service so bad, even the folks who don't have a choice find another way to make a trip. You can make it so inconvenient, you can make it so expensive, you can make it so dirty, they feel unsafe, that they'll make a choice. So we had a question, should we make this, should we specifically target in our design new customers or making the service and life better for our existing customers to possibly make more trips and better trips on the system? So we did that. We actually, at that all-day workshop, we played a, a, a series. I've, I'm, I've been told I cannot call them games. Uh, they're activities, because uh, we, we don't play games as professionals. Um, but we basically, you saw we had groups of about uh, six or seven at each table. And we designed a, basically a transit planning game where we gave them a fictional town that had a downtown, had a central park, had a med center, business parks. And you can see and, and sort of represent the population density. And all of, the, all of the lines are sort of streets. And then we gave them a certain amount of red tape, blue tape, and green tape representing service, frequency of service, and whether it was bi-directional or, or one direction. And we gave them a budget and said, design a system. And gave them about an hour and they had to talk about it. They had to negotiate with themselves. And then we posted them all on the wall and then we had them talk about their system. Um, and it was really interesting to hear what different groups thought was important. How some people just read that it was all red and it was all connecting the densest areas. And then there were other people who traded in all their red for as much green and had green wandering routes all over the place because everybody deserves service. But it wasn't political, it was hypothetical. So everybody felt warm and fuzzy <laughs> and felt like they were all planners for a day. We should have given them you know, little badges. Um, then we fed them lunch, sugared them all up, and then we did the really hard exercise. We did this for Houston. You can imagine we actually had a, uh, uh, I think it was a 40 by 40 grid um, where we put the light rail lines on there and we put all the major activity centers on there. And then we gave them, uh, basically they had to decide for each square how much money should they how much service should they provide there? And we gave them a budget. We gave them 300 units, which they didn't know, but represented the $300 million we roughly spend on local bus service a year. And this again, this big 20 by 20 grid. And we had this grid on, on a laptop, and there was a staff member, each one with a spreadsheet. And as they, as 
the, each group decided, okay, cell A1, we're going to have four units here. You know, I'm going to spend $4 million here, $8, $8 million here. And staff's job was simply to, to write that, or simply to note that in the spreadsheet, and it was designed to calculate it. And then we got to tell them when they were all out of money. I can tell you my group, again, this was a 20 by 20 square, so it was like 400 squares. Um, they didn't get halfway done. And I got to, you know, ring the bell. I said, sorry, you're out of money. The whole north part of our service area, eh, they didn't need anything anyway. And then they were all appalled. And they accused me of, you've added it wrong. I'm not doing any addition. Um, <laughs> blame Excel. Numbers are, you know, they're not alternative numbers. Uh, they, are, they are what they are. So then they, had to, then they had to negotiate with one another. Oh, well, I guess we really don't need five-minute bidirectional service in the best corridor. I guess we can bump that down to, you know, ten minutes, and, and we can move some here. And, and different people would, you know, would have lived. They know people in certain parts of the area that might not have the density. Um, but really argue those people really need it. And it was fascinating to watch, you know, six or seven, you know, super intelligent people argue with one another passionately about where we should have service. And I'll say it, it's the first time that I, I actually felt appreciation for what we do. And all those hard choices that we make day in and day out that we don't really think about the larger context of. But they all have consequences. Um, in this. So we went through this exercise. It was, uh, it was very good. And then we, we, we talked about it at length. And then we, we made note of how they had shifted resources, how the groups had decided as a whole where they were willing to move service to, because this was a, a zero sum game. We weren't going to increase the budget. So inherently, that means somebody wins, somebody loses. Someone's going to get more service, somebody has to get less. So um, this actually represented how many millions of dollars that they were willing to move in service from each individual square. So the red is where they were losing service. Um, and the green is where you know, our group of 80 stakeholders were willing to relocate service. And we actually put an online version of this game uh, up so that the public could, could play. And despite it not being um, it's more of a less of a monopoly or checkers, you know, time frame. It's more like a game of risk. Uh, takes takes a while to get through. Um, but we actually had had um, dozens of people actually take the time, go through this process online, and and we had we adjusted sort of the outcome. And again, this was all input into our discussion. How they felt about all the trade offs. How they felt where the emphasis should be in our, in our new system. And that was before staff and the consultants ever spent time drawing a single line on a map. And that took us seven or eight months. And that was really hard as a service planner because I can tell you I really love service planning. Give me a map, give me a bunch of crayons or pens and let me have at it. It's what I like, it's what I'm good at. Um, so the planner in me was very unsatisfied for uh, seven or eight months, but I really got appreciate really got an appreciation um, for how you build consensus on a plan. And then I'll talk about later. It's not just enough to have a great plan to then sit on a shelf and, and nothing happens. You have to be able to get to what I call. You have to be able to get to yes. You have to get to yes with the elected officials. You have to get yes to your board. You have to get yes to your uh, CEO, and you have to get yes to the public, or at least not a, an outright shouting at you, no. Um, so for us, defining uh, our definition all of this time with our public, we basically asked our the public and the board, what percentage of our public non-park and ride service resources do you want to devote to the goal of maximum ridership in this ridership versus coverage discussion? And for us, our existing system um, was about 50-50. About 50% of our service was on frequent routes in areas where we had high density of employment or, or population. But about half of it was not. It was in low density areas where you really 
should not expect that you are going to generate lots and lots of ridership. Um, so that shouldn't be your goal. So the discussion was, if you really want to increase ridership, you've got to move this needle. And there is no right answer to this question. I want to tell every community has to answer this question for themselves. What's right in Boise, what's right in Los Angeles, what's right, what's right in New York um, is different. And you know, our board ultimately really wanted to move the needle. Um, and they went with an 80-20 um, goal. However, they hedged their bets and said, we really want you to inconvenience as few of our existing riders as possible that I don't want to be yelled at uh, part. Um, that was a caveat that one of our board members added on to the discussion at the end, um, which made it uh, all the more challenging uh, for us. But the, the previous agency I had, I had worked for did a 65-35 uh, is what they had decided. And I thought our board was going to come down on a 70-30. But we actually were able to run some, some very good simulations and show them if you wanted a 40-60, a 50-50, 60-40, so on and so forth. What is the ridership implications? How many people are going to be outside of walking distance of the new system? Um, how many people will have frequent service? Um, how many jobs will likely be on that network? So they could sort of see those trade-offs and go, I want to be here, or at least as a goal. The board came down with 8020, and then um, then we got to work. Um, this was I actually had fun creating this. I actually, think I, I've actually been told you really do need to write a book, and I think if I had to write a book about this, this is probably what it would be. It would be for dummies. Um, how to reimagine service? So we actually got down. Uh, we actually got down to business. As I said, we had lots of data, and it was a very data-driven process. When you're devising a system from sort of that clean sheet, um, you're not supposed to be biased based on history. So you want to try and remove yourself and, and base it on the empirical data that you have. So it's not just, you know, as I said, a typical C COA basically lists every bus route in the system, tells you what its ridership, what its productivity, what its efficiency, what its on-time performance is. Nothing that's particularly helpful for redesigning a system. So we spent a lot of time looking at data and how it would be meaningful and what story would it tell. So looking at what the intensity of development was around particular bus routes, what the ridership was, and what's the correlation between the intensity of uses at different points on the route um, and its ridership, as well as productivity measures and, and uh, average speed and on-time performance so that we could talk about what's working and what's not and why. Um, some of the real interesting things that we looked at, um, poverty, age, income levels. One of my favorites is we actually got data uh, from the MPO on uh, the amount of freight traffic at particular intersections all throughout the city. Because a major source of delay for us is actually these crossings, which is a, a brilliant picture here of a bus actually waiting uh, at a grade crossing. And when we mapped all of those, we tried to avoid as many of those crossings as possible as we were designing the frequent network to keep them on time to keep them reliable, knowing that you can't avoid every one of these because there are neighborhoods on either side. Um, but trying to look at all the different types of data to try and be insightful in what we were doing. Tried to minimize distractions on all of this. Uh, simply, I, my consultant actually wanted us to uh, get a ballroom or a, a conference room at a hotel, I said, oh, I'm not signing that invoice uh, and having that audited and being on the front page of the paper. Um, so we actually went to one of our bus operating divisions and our COO gave us his conference room. And we sat around with lots of maps on the walls, whiteboards, uh, Google Street Maps at our disposal, and uh, put that intensity map down, put a plastic sheet over it, and started drawing. But the point was we got away from our day-to-day -day jobs at the headquarter building so that we could sort of minimize distractions. 
I threatened to take everybody's cell phones away uh, when we walked in, but they were relatively good, and we didn't have to do that. So we actually uh, drew the network, and, and the amazing thing is, you know, we started with the frequent network, where the most intensity is, where you're gonna get the most of your riders, that's the easy part. That was our first day's worth of work. And I can tell you, this is about 80 to 85%. It's what we have today. It's the rest. It's the coverage that we then spent months arguing about. Fewer and fewer people, which is the nature of the design. It's the nature of politics. Um, but it also helped, I think it helped staff, you know, assure them they knew what they were doing. Um, and to see this, this picture uh, back then, that we, um, we had a really good process. So what were some of the key pieces of the reimagining network? Again, talked about frequency. That was our old network on weekdays. Uh, this was our seven day a week network. 22, well, this was actually 24 frequent routes. Um, we also had a number of uh, those green zones up in the north and the northeast uh, were dialer ride zones, again, trying to keep this cost neutral. We went from a very downtown hub and spoke system to a grid. Again, this was based on comments from our uh, stakeholder group. Some of the benefits of the grid, this is what I love. This is the Shepherd Corridor in our old network. The, the one on the left, um, to go end to end in this roughly 12 miles required four buses and a walk of about a mile and a half uh, between them to do. Um, and there were transit centers on both ends of this corridor. The new system on the right, one route, frequent 15 minutes, seven days a week. Again, easy to understand. You know if you run Shepherd, it's one route, runs most of the day. It's a seven day a week system, whereas this again, you saw a weekday on the old system, Saturday, Sunday. This was proposed seven days a week. No more phone calls on, or no more messages on Monday morning from customer service telling me so and so called and complained the bus never showed up yesterday, to which I replied it didn't show up because it wasn't running. Um, can't imagine how many of those phone calls I'd, I'd get every single week. Um, no more of those. Um, Maintained access. Um, again, our board asked to you know minimize uh, minimize the problems for our existing customers. So we had about two hundred and seven thousand weekday boardings on our local bus under the old system. Only sixty seven of those were bus stops that were outside of a half mile of a bus stop in the new network. Far better than what we had told the board in the trials. We told them when they had chosen eighty twenty that we could have it would be less than one percent. So about 2,000, we said, boardings uh, might be outside of a half mile. So way better. And I'll say since then, the board actually made us put in another route uh, in a community that represented about 32 of those boardings. Um, so we're even down to less. So almost everybody who had service under the old network had it under the new service. It might be a different route, different frequency, different name, but they still had access to service. So how was our service cost neutral, we reduced uh, duplication, one route, one street. Straighter routes, uh, without having to bob through all of these different uh, neighborhoods, stay on major streets, we improved bus speeds. We were able to, as the three light rail lines opened, we were able to redeploy some of the resources from those uh, corridors. We actually, and this was a big one, we actually reduced weekday bus service by 4%. Four, 4%. I've not found another agency that's actually done this in their redesign. Um, and this was a real risky thing. Because most of the people who complain to our board are friends of theirs or employees of theirs. They're Monday through Friday park and ride users. And all they care about is what operates from 6 to 9 in the morning and 3 to 6 in the afternoon. And that's not your whole market. And for a lot of agencies, if you actually look at your hour by hour ridership, it's shifting. Um, so we actually reduced our service on weekdays by about 4%. That helped us add 30% more bus service on Saturday. We nearly doubled the new amount of service on Sundays. Uh, there's just, again, this was in response to what we heard from our stakeholders. And we replaced a lot of our low-performing fixed route service with general public dialer ride zones. So how did we get the plan uh, approved? And what I call, how did we get to yes? Um, we talked about from the very beginning, 
if the board's not willing to sit there and be yelled at and hear the most heart-wrenching stories about what this is going to be, that I'm not going to be able to go see my dying brother, I'm not going to be able to get to dialysis, it, you can't imagine some of the things. Um, if you're not prepared to take that, let's not go down this road. Let's not spend the million dollars that we spent on the study. Let's not you know, trouble staff. They have other things to do. Um, but our board was willing through the whole process. We understand that. But we also had made the compelling argument through this whole thing. The system is broken. We have to do something about that. We're not going to quibble about that. We're going to argue about the details. This route, that route. But we're not going to argue what we're doing right now. We can't keep doing it. Or we can, but ridership is going to continue to go down. We told this compelling story, as I just mentioned, um, that very few people could argue with. Even the people who were not happy with the system, they were unhappy with the old system too, and they were not share, they were not uh, shy to tell us about that. We have about 80 elected officials in Houston. We visited each one of them three times at different stages in the process, so they wouldn't be surprised. Gave them materials that were specific to their area to help them answer questions from constituents when they called. But significant outreach to, uh, to a whole lot of people, explaining the why, the how, the when, um, really helped uh, create a lot of uh, advocates for it. And we were willing to adapt. When we did get pushed back at the end and the board was ready to, to get it approved, they were willing to, to make some changes. As my CEO, you know, as I was down one particular day, my CEO pulled me aside and said, look, would you rather this whole project go away or are you willing to compromise on 10 or 15% to get 85 or 90% of what you think we need? And uh, that's why he's CEO. He summed it up real quick for me. And you have to, don't lose the forest for the trees. Um, and we were willing to make some compromises and adapt there. So for our board, they ultimately, all the dial ride zones disappeared. We put back lots of wandering green routes in that particular area. We did a lousy job, I'll be honest, staff explaining what, um, what the dial ride type service would be. Um, when the board made those changes, it actually made, means we had to run more fixed route service on, on Saturday and Sunday, and we had to open another bus operating facility to do that. Um, and that had some costs. We, only, we have six. We were only planning on running three uh, on the weekend. We had to open a fourth one. And so the board, we were in a very fortunate position. Our sales tax was going up, and the board said, yeah, we'll increase the bus service budget by about 4%. $12 million sounds a lot, but our agency's budget is roughly a billion dollars. So it was a, a relative drop in the bucket. So that was the... Uh, that was the final network, 22 frequent routes, seven days a week. And uh, capital cost of the plan, uh, we very minimal, mostly bus stop changes. We're shifting, we're buying more ticks in the future instead of 40-foot buses. We have a couple transit centers we need to expand. And a lot of changes to bus stops and ADA compliance type stuff. But things that are generally in your CIP anyway, to just sort of move that money around. So for us, at the end of the plan, it represented um, one of the real selling points was more than double the amount of people who had access to frequent service seven days a week. And the number of jobs was up by over 50%. And this was a real selling point. Transit, for many people, it's a means to an end. Now, I've, we've all met those, those transit fanatics who are at the opening of every train line, Bus rapid transit service, Lo love to ride buses and trains, and yes, I, I do love to ride buses and trains too. Kurt, be careful with the audience you're talking to. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, they're customers too. We love you. Um, but for the vast majority of folks, transit is a means to an end. It's a way to better yourself. If you have more frequent service, you are able to get to more jobs in 30 minutes, in an hour you will have more jobs to choose from that might pay you more, that have a better schedule, that are more flexible, that meet your needs. And the same thing, um, the same thing with school and everything. So having more frequent service, having it seven days a week, really increases people's opportunities to improve themselves. And, and we don't tell those stories. Uh, 
I, I like to tell you, politicians have become masterful at um, telling you just enough information to convince you that their particular perspective is correct. And they'll stand up to lectern and they will give you that example of this individual person. They're great at telling the stories. Joe the coal miner this. If we were just able to help Joe, all of rural poverty would be relieved and they traipse Joe up and his wife and three kids. Um, we do a lousy job of that generally in the public sector, of telling our story and how what we do impacts our customers. Um, and we really focus on, on compelling graphics and, and statistics and um, stories from people on how this affected them and what it allowed them uh, to do. So as I mentioned, the, the plan is not enough. Um, I could talk for hours on just how we got there, but um, we had a very supportive CEO uh, who actually rode the buses talk with staff members, we had a board. Um, many of these people you hear are actually our board members who went uh, and rode, engaged, uh, talked. Uh, our board even uh, started a new board committee just to oversee this project because um, they were really focused and, and supporting of this. We actually had a, a dedicated project team. We actually moved a lot of staff around we did not want consultants leading the implementation. We felt it was very important to have staff who knows the ins and outs of how we get things done. We had dedicated um, leadership. We had two project managers for different aspects of the implementation. Um, and we actually, um, we had a very small leadership team that met um, every week and we talked about what needed to happen this next week. And we looked at the schedule and saw what was behind. And then when we all met, um, we asked very pointed questions of our colleagues. You know, hey, marketing, how's such and such coming along? Knowing full well that I've gotten an update that they're two weeks behind schedule or the HR hasn't hired enough bus drivers yet. Um, to reinforce and publicly shame when necessary, um, your colleagues uh, to doing what they're responsible for because no one person in the agency can be responsible for for everything you have to you have to be able to hold people accountable so we've got a we actually treated this just like a major capital construction project um, so for those of you who have ever used Microsoft Project, we use something called Primavera, which is uh, popular among engineers, to log over 700 uh, different activities in, from IT, customer service, um, scheduling, run cuts, everything, uh, shared information. And we really focused not on what a department needed to do, but on these different activities, because so many of them were cross-functional uh, across the departments. So this is just one page that represents, oh, about 15 or 20 of our activities. And again, in, in typical project management fashion, you have linkages, um, and you see the interdependencies that, gosh, if you're late hiring bus drivers, then you're late training them um, and certifying them, um, which affects when you need your trainers, when you need schedules and maps for marketing. Uh, so we had to make sure that all of this flowed because the board only gave us six months to implement this. I would asked our CEO for 18 months, or I asked our chair for 18 months, he gave me six. Um, we were able to convert, uh, we did this in one day, this was not a layered approach. Uh, we stopped the system one day, the next day we started a whole new system. So we had to come up with a whole, how do you run one service, one system on Saturday and a different service on Sunday. And I'll say we, um, we learned uh, that from Jacksonville, they had actually gone through uh, a much smaller and their idea was simply to, um, they bagged all of their bus stops, they put the existing system information on the outside of the bags, and they put all the new signs on underneath the bag so that in the middle of the night they could go and rip off all of the bags and the system was uh, good. So. That worked for us. 
challenging with 10,000 bus stops, um, but we were able to do that. And we also put uh, one of these at every one of our bus stops, um, which is information about the new service and when it would start. And lots of quality control checks uh, to get all the signage uh, done, different communication strategies. I have some pictures of the bags later. Hiring activities, staffing, uh, again, was a, a big deal. I talked to you just about uh, the bus operators, but we had many mechanics, um, lots of people in operations that we needed to hire and train. So our Office of Management and Budget had to approve these new positions. HR had to find them, hire. Then we, our training department had to train them. And we, we relied heavily on personal service contracts. And we rehired at least in operations a lot of folks who had recently retired. We had a bunch of supervisors, a couple of superintendents who had recently retired, and they were willing to come back on a short term to help us with the, with the transition. Uh, lots of activities. This is uh, internal training for our, uh, everyone in our agency had to go to an hour long training about the whys and the whos and, and the whats. Uh, because everyone could be answering questions when they were riding a train, riding a bus or out staffing a table. Uh, we hired a dedicated street team of about 20 people to go ride bus routes, be at transit centers for a couple months beforehand, handing out information, uh, which really helped. On the IT side, we launched really into our uh, smartphone apps. We introduced our app, we introduced next bus texting. The first day of our system, we did a uh, dual trip planner that is very frightening Type in your origin, type in your destination, shows you your trip under the old system, and shows you the trip under the new system. God, I hope it's better. Um, and guess what? The only, the only times we heard about it is when they were worse. Um, so we had to constantly remind management, no one's going to call back and say, hey, you made my trip 20 minutes better. That's not how it works. Um, so we had a lot of IT stuff going on. Um, as well as stress testing our agency's website to make sure that it could handle the uh, increase uh, and not crash. It actually didn't crash. Our phone system crashed, um, but the website managed to, to hold up. So we actually expanded our call center, added stations, a lot of temporary hires as we knew we'd get crushed for, uh, for two, three weeks, increased the operation in the hours, training um, for those. We... Messaging was really important for all this. We, um, our CEO would go on the 5 o'clock news, talk about the system, then we'd actually set up phone banks at both the English and Spanish stations and take phone calls for an hour and a half. Like it was, hey, it's time to pledge to the Shriners or whatever. Um, so we did those. Our CEO actually did a weekly um, chat that we posted on our internal website talking about the new bus network and what the theme of the particular week was. So we tried to reach people and do training in all sorts of different ways. This is just a video. Up on the road less travel. Probably nowhere really great. Give me the road more travel. With a dependable bus service that comes every 15 minutes or less. Throw us a weekend service too while you had it. And more options for connections throughout the region. Yeah. See you later, Road Less Travel. Welcome to Metro's new bus network. All right. <laughs> so for those of you who remember, remember the Matthew McConaughey um, ad for, I can't remember if it was Cadillac or, or Lincoln. Or Lincoln. Um, that was about the same time. So that was that was all filmed by, by Metro. That was actually one of our bus operators. Um, I met him and said, Damn, you got a sexy voice. <laughs> so whatever. So we tried all different sorts of strategies. No, we didn't have millions and millions of dollars to, to do. I've got a couple different examples. Metro's new bus network means thousands of our bus stop signs across the region are getting a makeover. The new bus network will affect every route on our system and some of those routes will be getting new numbers and names. This change will become effective with our service change on August 16th. Until then, we are covering every bus stop sign with a bag. The bag gives you the current route information. You'll also see this information on posters at each stop. 
It will tell you how often the bus will come during peak and off-peak hours. Some of these posters will show a mini map of that particular route. One great feature you'll notice is that every bus stop sign will also tell you the final destination of that particular route. Metro's new bus network. More service, better service, your service. And those were actually our taglines. So every so for the three months beforehand, one month was all about more service, the next month better service, and then your service. So we really, again, easy things to understand, and every week was sort of a different subsection of more service. We talked about frequency one week, and we talked about more weekend service the next week, more connections, um, so that we could all roll these things over, and it worked for email blasts, it worked for online, it worked for, for Twitter and Facebook, uh, as well as all of our print media. So I've got a couple others here, but we're uh, running out of time, so that we really spent a lot of time with our core messages and making it easy to, for folks to understand. Um, the first week, still a blur uh, for me, much like when you have your first kid, you don't really sleep, you just go on adrenaline. Um, we set up our, our uh, emergency management center, so for hurricanes, the Super Bowl, um, and for the new bus network, um, we staffed it 18 hours a day uh, for the first week with folks from operations planning, police, um, social media, so that whatever issue that we heard about, we could respond to and, and decide, did we need to send a taxi to pick somebody up? Did we need to go clear something? Were we having bus punching problems? Um, did we have bus stops that were missing? Uh, did we need to move some of our staff around because we were having more crowds at particular locations? So that was, um, that was really important uh, to have that focus that first week. Just some more uh, part of our unveiling plan, uh, making service free for the first week uh, was really important. We didn't want anybody who got on the wrong bus to have to pay twice. Uh, for that, that relieved a lot of people's anxiety. Pushed information out again, lots of different ways. Um, it was a long week, but it was very good. So in the end, talk about, it's been about two and a half years now. So for us, you sort of remember that, that trend line of our ridership was going down. So 2014, that light blue, sort of, again, you see the ebb and flows month to month. But you get to 2015 when we're going to implement the new bus network, and you see sort of month over month, ridership still going down for us. Um, and it was really depressing, our senior management. Um, and put a little extra added pressure uh, on this process. So you finally see in, in the June time frame, we had our first uptick in quite a while. Um, that's when our, our last two light rail lines of the three that I talked about opened up. And then through the summer, we were up slightly until you get to August. Thank God. Um, ridership actually went up. Um, people responded very favorably to it. You see the rest of the year up every month. The following year, then in green, continue to be up. We get to about the one year point in the summer and the comparisons obviously start to get a little bit harder. We're up about 7.5% the first year. This is at a time the industry is still losing. Our major peers in, in Texas have lost on average another 5% of their ridership that year. And for the next year, largely we were flat um, ridership wise. We'd be up a percent or two, down a percent or two um, every month. But we're also going through, our economy was not great. Everybody loves low, uh, low gas prices. It's time for pretty low gas prices when they were bottoming out. Not so great in Houston where all those companies are headquartered. So employment uh, took a big hit for us. It took a little bit to recover. But you can see now in 2017, we're starting to grow again. And the, the real important point, despite August when our friend Harvey came to visit, um, we're higher now than every, in every month than we were sort of before we did this. So, you all notice this is the opposite of virtually every graph I've shown you. <laughs> so, which is why I continue to be on the road talking to lots of transit agencies, wondering what did you do, how did you do it, um, why did you do it. Um, and we talk about the same things that I taught you. You really need to want to. You need to admit that we've ignored a lot of issues for a long time. You know, everybody... Every, virtually every uh, 
time I'm interviewed by the press, they all want to talk about, oh, Uber and Lyft, it's going to be the end. Uber and Lyft is killing transit. Uber and Lyft is not killing transit. Uber and Lyft might have, maybe in San Francisco, maybe have a slight impact. But in most places, most cities, most people riding transit cannot afford a $12 Uber ride. It's, they're not comparable. Yes, they're great. You go out bar hopping um, for late night service, airport trips. They're replacing taxi trips for the most part. It's we have to make our service better. And we've ignored our service for, for way too long and what people like. And so that is, that's good because I'm actually at the end. That's me. If you uh, ever have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. If you have questions later on, feel free to call or email me. And it was uh, a pleasure as always to be back. Of the class session, if you want, maybe we'll just step out. I think there may be a class coming in. And if you have any questions for Kurt out here in the elevator for, for 10 minutes or so, uh, if you want to ask him anything. But anyway, thanks so much for this. And uh, if there's a sheet there, could you pass it uh, up?